It's a wonderful day in the homie hood, a wonderful day for a homie. Won't you be my homie to Taro? Today is February 17th. It is a Friday. For some of us, it's a long weekend because Monday is family day. So I'm wishing you a very happy, happy long weekend. Uh, if you're able to take some time uh, to spend with your, with your loved ones. We're going to jump into the news here. Every morning we wake up, I read the Globe and Mail, and we go over some of the Canadian headlines. It's true, it is mainstream news, uh, but we try to dissect it in a way uh, that helps us understand what's actually going on, while also highlighting some, some things that are going on in Canada that are maybe not so, so trendy, so popular to talk about, so we can, can actually understand what's going on with our lives. So, today is Friday. And I wanted to start with a little bit of this pop culture, or sorry, popular mechanics, I guess you could say. Um, I guess there's an auto show happen happening in Toronto. And Project Aero is the first all-Canadian electric vehicle making its de debut at this Toronto International Auto Show. So basically, uh, the gist of it is that, you know... Canada wants to have its own Tesla and they're they're working really hard to make that happen. So, among the cutting edge features of the Aero are a solar panel roof and a 3D printed chassis as well as a driver's seat and a steering wheel that can tell if the driver is experiencing a medical emergency, then instruct the car to head to the nearest hospital. So, I guess, you know, that's kind of cool. I don't really know how that's going to work in reality. Like this whole self-driving car trend, uh, it sounds like it might cr like turn a, <laughs> a medical emergency into an even bigger medical emergency once it creates like a car crash. Uh, yeah, Core 10K, it really is a Tesla. Um, so what they've done here is create a kit for anybody that wants to do an automotive startup in Ontario or Quebec. So basically they're looking for an Elon, you know, they're looking for someone to come in with, with the money and invest in this project. Um, they just have to solve the hardest part, which is to get some risk capital. Everything else I've got on the menu, come and get it. And by the way, it's free. It's already been developed. So they're, yeah, really they're just looking for like a daddy Elon to come and like put up the money. Um, the Aero was designed by four students at Carleton University, then developed and assembled at Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, Ontario. It was funded by $5 million in grants from the federal government, $1.8 million from Ontario, and $1.4 million from Quebec. The latter's contribution went directly to the companies involved. The parts maker's contribution contributed $12 million worth of one-off parts research and development. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's literally just like Tesla North. Um, if you haven't heard, like Ontario, Quebec, Canada, they're really going hard trying to get into the, the electric car EV uh, market. So this is something obviously that, you know, investors maybe are, are, are looking at. Um, it's, it's, to me, just an extension of the problems that we face. Um, on this channel, we know that, you know, capitalism is the problem. If we just like shift capitalism from gas powered cars in, in, into electric vehicles, we're not really, we're not really hitting the root of, um, what is causing the environmental crises of the world. So, you know, we're still pretty skeptical of this, but a lot of people, I think a lot of investors, a lot of maybe liberals you know are going to get on board with stuff like this and it, it's uh it's it's not really a solution if we all just bought an electric car today we would still be in the exact same situation that we're in so we need to invest in public transit uh if you are if you were here for our previous segment so uh, another thing that's happening today, we're probably going to cover this on Monday. So please make sure that you like and subscribe so you don't miss it. The Emergencies Act inquiry's final report is to be released on Friday. That's today. So later today, they're going to release something. Uh, obviously, if you've uh, been living in Canada, you probably have heard about the convoy protest that happened uh, last year. Um, and just uh, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, declared the Emergencies Act for the first time in the history of Canada. So um, a lot of people were in support of the Emergencies Act being declared. But, you know, uh, over here on the on the far left, uh, we recognize that, hey, this is something that really like should have not happened. 
um we this is something that affects the rights of all canadians you know once once someone's rights are diminished even if they're your political enemy that's not really a good thing for canada in general and we never should have uh gotten to this situation the way we get to this situation is because um you know police are are pretty incompetent and pretty conservative, if not far right leaning. So Stephanie Carvin, an associate professor at Carleton University and a former federal intelligence analyst agreed with me, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm continuing the article at the end here. So uh, Stephanie Carvin says, I think it's gonna come down to a very thin line as opposed to a hard line. I think he may say, yes, it was justified, but it was problematic invoking the act. Or he'll say it wasn't justified, but it was understandable. So basically, uh, what the prediction here is that it's going to be a very milk toast, um, milk toast uh, announcement once they release this. Chat is saying that Stephanie Carvin is the tenure death cake lady. I have no idea what that means. Um, so media is reading it at 10 a.m. Uh, it says vaccines, baby. Hey, maybe uh, if we're done the news in time, that's 15 minutes from now, we, we can watch it live. Um, but she added, understanding how police and various levels of government got to the point where the act was needed is perhaps even more important than the invocation itself. Canada's institutions failed. She said, I think the bottom line for Canadians is better understanding how we got here. Uh, got there, sorry. Um, so, you know, how we got there is uh, police are super incompetent. Police are, are like fascist sympathizers, go figure. And Doug Ford was super slow uh, to declare uh, an emergency in Ontario. And, uh, you know, there's there's other failings of other levels of government for sure. Um, but, you know, how did we get here? And whose fault is it? I don't know. I, I just think it's everyone's fault. Uh, and including including the fascists who have really no idea what makes a, a good protest. And let's face it, they were trying to do their own version of, of January 6th. It was just unsuccessful. Okay, so Bank of Canada's Jeff Macklem uh, says potential recession will be less severe than earlier downturns. Oh, good, no good news, everyone. Actually, we have a... Uh, we have we have something for this. Um, let let let's let's hear it. Well, yes, I see. Good news, everyone. It's like okay, so good news, everyone. We're gonna have a recession, but it won't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um Jeff oh sorry it's not Jeff Macklem it's Tiff Macklem my bad um it's going it's not going to feel great but it is going to feel like what people it is not going to feel like what people think of when you say the word recession okay the bread lines are already are already uh around the corner Tiff um uh, Mr Macklem reiterated that the Bank of Canada does not expect to raise interest rates further despite a stronger than expected January jobs report published on Friday. But he said he's willing to hike rates again if inflation does not drop as much as the bank is forecasting. So I don't know, I don't know how they constructed this sentence because they're like, hey, we're not going to raise interest rates, but we might raise interest rates again. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, you know, that sucks. Uh, you know, that's that's going to be brutal, but OK. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about a soft landing. They're trying to reach this, which seems like impossible uh, target of two percent inflation. Um, and meanwhile, they what they really want to happen is uh, for us to all be unemployed. <laughs> all, <laughs> um, and that's how they're going to save the the economy is if you uh, if you contribute to unemployment. And uh, so 150,000 jobs were created in January, 10 times the amount uh, Bay Street analysts were forecasting. So so to give you a sense of like, d does the Bank of Canada do, does Bay Street have a grip on this? They all, I honestly think they have like no idea what they're doing. Um, the criticisms I've seen is that they they just really don't understand this financial situation that they're in that we're in. They've they've misread the situation. They they're contributing this to like unemployment and and wages when the reality is the reason that we're having a recession is uh is not under normal circumstances. It's related to the pandemic. It's related to Russia invading Ukraine. It's related to China's uh COVID zero strategy affecting uh, supply lines, but we're we're treating this as if it's like the Great Recession, and and like uh, I don't know, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, when we went into the, another recession, um, you know. But it's but it's a completely different situation. However, they're not reacting 
completely differently. They're using the same old playbook. So Mr. Macklem and his team want to see economic activity slow and unemployment rise. So yeah, basically, if you could just get fired from your job, um, instead of instead of having to work two or three jobs, if you could just get that number down all the way to zero, that would be great for the economy. And it, you know, if you're a true patriot, you'll simply find a way to get fired from your job. Uh, well, jobs, because you know, in this economy, we all we all need several. Um, the tightness in the labor market needs to ease. Wage growth needs to moderate. So. This is something I think very controversial. This is not a recession that is attributed to wage growth. Wage growth is increasing very slowly compared to inflation. It's 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 uh, something I've even seen here debunked in the Globe Globe and Mail. So it's like I don't I don't I honestly don't know why they're they're pushing this without any pushback. Um, in, in this particular article, I guess I don't know. It's the business section. The business section tends to be a little different of a tone. Um, low unemployment and high demand for workers is pushing up wages. Again, it is, but just a little bit, just a little bit, you know, like compared to inflation, which, which is feeding through the to inflation, this is saying, which is like, it's, it's, it is, but just a little bit, not, it's not the root cause and they're acting as if it's the root cause. So honestly, I'm not someone who is like super well-versed in economics, but Hey, if you read the newspaper every day, you start to get a bit of a sense of what's going on. So, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect when it comes to these economic issues. It's really hard to parse through because we're fed so much BS, but, uh, you know, I'm doing my best. And, you know, if you, if you feel differently, please, please comment. I'll fight you in the comments below. Okay, so this was the big news uh, for today. There's a very fear mongery kind of like uh, headline on the front page, which I've already lost. Um, and CSIS documents reveal Chinese strategy to influence the 2021 election. So I guess this is something that we've been leading up to, um, but the CSIS documents have finally been released. Honestly, having read this entire article, it's like, okay, I'm not that scared, but it does feel like very fear mongery, especially when you feel as though like every day is like China balloons, Russia war, uh, you know, and then like, oh, now that China's interfering with our elections. I'm like, can we just like, can we just like try to like ease tensions a little bit or are we just going to escalate and escalate and escalate? So, um, this, uh, this, uh, document is claiming that, um, China interfered in the 2019 election campaign to support 11 candidates, most of them liberal, I believe nine liberals and two conservatives. There were two primary aims of this uh, campaign, which was to ensure that a minority liberal government was returned in 2021 and that certain conservative candidates identified by China were defeated. So basically, my takeaway from all this is like, wow, China wants what we all want. <laughs> a liberal minority government with less conservatives. It's like, uh, it's like, okay, well, like, you know, like that's what the majority of Canadian wants. Obviously, I want more than that. I want I want to see a much more progressive government. Um, but you know, this this tends to be like the middle ground that a lot of Canadians fall on is is like a liberal minority because we don't want the liberals to have too much power. We don't want a conservative majority either. We just want like a minority government so that there's a there's a relatively balanced c control over what happens. So um one consular official at an unnamed Chinese diplomatic mission in Canada said Beijing likes it when the parties in parliament are fighting with each other, whereas if there is a majority, the party in power can easily implement policies that do not favor the People's Republic of China. So again, China has all of our best interests at heart, by it seems. Um, okay, but this is this is serious. Election tampering is serious. This is something that we should be concerned about. I'm just my concern is that it's not as serious as they say, and that we can. We can solve problems like this by having a more transparent, a more democratic election process. Yeah, it's really easy to tamper with our elections because our elections are trash because we have a first past the post system. If we had proportional representation, it would be so much harder for them to mess with the system because every vote for every Canadian would count. But we don't live in that system. We live in this very antiqui antiquated system. So, um, 
you know, the problem for me is not China bad. The problem for me is like our electoral system is 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 super outdated and our electoral system is bad and our leaders are bad because they have no political will to change it. So um China uh again here they're saying what uh oh yeah, they tried to fear monger saying that um uh, the conservative party would do things like Donald Trump, including banning Chinese students from certain universities. Um, you know, so this will affect the education of some some Chinese some rich Chinese folks who are <laughs> sending their their children into the Canadian education system. And uh they also said that it's easy to influence Chinese immigrants to agree with the PRC's stance. Um, which I actually disagree. If you if you meet some people from China who have who have uh, migrated to Canada, a lot of them they're not huge fans of the 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 Communist Party of China or the or they're they're not very patriotic. That's why they left. Um, you know, and once they get a taste of that good old Canadian uh, freedom, they're like, hey, this is kind of nice. Um, so I don't know. It, I, I guess. There are there are obviously a, a diverse amount of uh, Chinese folks who who migrate to Canada, but uh, here it, the, the CSIS report says that Chinese Canadian community of British Columbia that missed Hong missed Hong was the uh, consul general um, for Vancouver. Um, it was very obvious that she wanted the Liberal Party to win the 2021 election. So, you know, I guess, I don't know, it's probably not good for to be in that position and come out with a public statement about who you want to win. Um, particularly, Kenny Chu uh, was an MP who was targeted for his criticism of China's crackdown in Hong Kong and um, also the private member's bill aiming to establish a registry for foreign agents, which, you know, ad admit admittedly, this is probably something that I agree with the conservatives on. Like, yeah, uh, China shouldn't crack down on Hong Kong. And, you know, we probably should have a registry of foreign agents. That does make sense from like a national security standpoint. So oddly enough, you know, this is one rare instance where I'm like, hey, conservatives, I, I guess I agree with them. So uh, Mr. Chu, Kenny Chu lost lost that race and some other conservatives lost their races. Aaron O'Toole alleged, probably because he was butthurt, that um, it cost the uh, the party eight or nine seats. If you don't know, Aaron O'Toole was the conservative leader in that election. So, so probably a pretty biased situation there. Um, one criticism for Trudeau is that he never, he knew about this potential tampering, election tampering, but he never issued any public warning. Um, which, you know, if you, if, which I don't know, I don't honestly don't know how I feel about it because if Trudeau had said, Hey, just so you know, like China might be interfering with our election before the, before the election took place, that would have influence the election in its own way so I, I i honestly don't know how i feel about it however this CSIS um document excuse me found that trudeau uh was not guilty of meddling and that there was no indication that china's interference efforts had helped elect any of the people so I honestly don't know what to think about this. It's like the headline is completely different than the last two paragraphs of the article. It's like, hey, China is is guilty of election interference. And then the conclusion is that, well, there was no indication that China's interference efforts had actually assisted in electing any of the people that they were they have been accused of uh, supporting. So it's it's like, OK. I don't I honestly just get the feeling that this is a lot of uh fear mongering. Okay. Uh the last thing for today, very quickly, Ottawa introduced a bill to overhaul how wrong uh to overhaul how wrongful convictions are reviewed. This is actually one of those stories that is like really important to Canadians, but it's not gonna get any traction in social media because it's not that exciting. Um the headlines are not that exciting. Um, but basically this means that um People can now come forward and and even if they've pleaded guilty, they can make a it's not an appeal. It's they can get their cases examined um, because in a lot of these cases um, and this would particularly encourage black and indigenous applicants who have been wrongly convicted to come forward and make uh, examine, examine their case um, in order to get out. So. 
to, to, to no longer be wrongly convicted. So under the current system, the federal justice minister is responsible for looking into potential miscarriages of justice that can take years and has produced just a trickle of findings in favor of prisoners, roughly one per year. So one per year is for wrongful convictions is just like obviously not enough. And I mean, this should just be part of our justice system. Like, yes, like X amount of people per year are going to be convicted, wrongly convicted of, of something they didn't do. So like we need to have this system is like, okay, well, how do we, how do we, how do we correct ourselves um, when we know the justice system is inadequate? Um, okay. So the review body would have a wide mandate. Among other things, it would be responsible for reaching out to inmates and supporting those who may lack the resources to apply for reviews. Yeah, turns out once you've been wrongfully convicted and thrown in jail, you might not actually have a lot of resources. And so this would go also beyond uh, the uh, an appeal. So you could appeal, you would have to exhaust all of your appeals, and then you could enter this additional process, which would do a th more thorough e examination. So uh, new Democrats have pushed to amend the process of how wrongful conviction complaints are reviewed for years. So although this changes change comes after years of the liberals delaying, it is a welcome first step at ensuring fairness and equality, says uh, Randall Garrison, the MP and NDP's justice critic. So uh, the Conservative Party did not respond to a request for comment. So what's going on there is, you know, NDP will always blame the Liberals and say, well, they, I can't, it's, I'm glad they did it, but it took them too long. And the Conservative Party is like, well, we don't know how we feel. We don't, we don't, we don't like to comment on things when uh, the Liberals and Trudeau are doing a good job. We, don't, we, only, we only talk our, our BS about them. So basically that's what's going on there. That's, that's the, the, the news, the headlines for... Friday, February 17th. Thank you so much for tuning in to My Homie Tutaro on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. Um, we do the news every weekday here on Twitch, and then we get that video as soon as we can over to YouTube. So thank you so much.